Good morning. It's wonderful to be able to worship together, albeit via the internet. Uh, before we start, I just want to acknowledge and thank everyone working so hard behind the back to make it possible so that we can have these wonderful facilities to worship and see each other and connect with one another uh, via the WhatsApp or the internet. Now, today is a mission Sunday for our church and I'd like to spend some time considering this verse which is in John 17 verse 18. The uh, you know the sort of sending and being sent and uh, we will also consider later on how this means to us especially uh, in the current crisis because of the pandemic situation. Now, verse 17 is part of a prayer of Jesus and he prayed this as he was uh, preparing himself to face the cross ahead uh, in less than a day's time. Now, in his prayer, I'm sure uh, his mind is now focused on the purpose of his mission and um, why he was there and uh, what he was doing. And, um, and I think if you look at this verse, this first half, the Lord is actually addressing the Father. And he said, Lord, as you sent me into the world. Now that express a very, very clear um, sentiment that the Son knows very well the heartbeat of the Father. He knows not only the purpose of his coming to earth, he knows this is part of the great plan of the Father in the salvation of the whole humanity. Now, what is God's plan for this sin-sick world? Or put it another way, has God a plan for everyone on earth that is enslaved by greed, selfishness, and all form of evil desires. So I think to answer this, I think we need to go back further and consider this question of what is God's plan for the world? Does he care about what this world is heading to? Now the answer is a firm yes. He cares for the world that he has created. He cares about it in the past, since the creation. He cares for us now, the present, and he cares for our destiny, the future. Now he has shown it very clearly in the past, as it was recorded in Genesis, since his creation of this beautiful universe. At the center of it, he has put humanity in it. We are created in his image and gets and God cares that humanity should be restored in the glory that we were created for. Now, unfortunately, back in Genesis chapter 3, which is not on the screen. And if you have the Bible, you can flick through it, but it doesn't really matter. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, when humanity sinned against God and rebelled and chose to work, uh, walk in our own way, we have fallen at, in four aspects. Firstly, physically, humanity will die. 
It means that we are all subject to decay and death. Secondly, we see in the fall of humanity, we are using our rational power to explain away and to give excuses for our own wrongdoings. We're very good at that, aren't we? To rationalize our own selfish desires or evil means. Thirdly, socially, since sin has destroyed the harmonious relationship between human beings, we gave away to all forms of, you know, um, sinful acts. Hostility are found between you know, husband and wives, friends and families. So we are not only affected physically, in, intellectually, socially, and spiritually, Fourthly, spiritually, humanity has alienated from God. We have turned our back from God and reject his goodness and authority. Now, so this is what we see in the Bible back in Genesis. But God chose not to abandon or destroy his creation, but to save it. Now, that's the wonderful part of it, isn't it? Since the creation, God has not stopped saving the world. For example, in the story of Noah, right? I don't want to go into the details, but what we see there, God is a saving God. He shows salvation to Noah who calls on him, who walks with him. Another figure in the Old Testament in Abraham, right? When God called him to himself, God is showing himself that he is the source of our blessing. And his desire is to bless Abraham, not only himself and his, and his descendants, but his intention is to bless the whole world, all nations, through Abraham. And the third example that we can think of is the Exodus story. Now God has shown himself as the redeeming God who came down and rescued the descendants of Abraham from the captivities, from the lifelong slavery and also from the genocide which threatened their whole race, the whole descendants, all the descendants of Abraham. But God came to rescue, to save, and give them freedom and bring them to new life. Now the whole book of Old Testament is full of such accounts showing that the Lord is indeed the saving God whose desire is to bring back the fallen humanity to himself, to restore them to the glory that we were created for. Now that is in the heart of God. So the entire Jewish history in the Old Testament gives us stories after stories of God sending out his servants to bring about his salvation plan, not only for Israel, but for all nations. Now today is not the time to go through the Old Testament, but it is fair to say that the history of Israel in the Bible can be called as the salvation history, which we can see that God has not stopped sending his servants at different time to bring the fallen humanity to salvation. 
And that's why Paul, as he looked back, and he said in Galatians 4, chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, which is not on your screen, and he said, but when the set time has fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. So in a nutshell, Jesus did not just arrive, he was sent, right? Makes it very clear, God sent his son. And if you go back to the first slide, John chapter 17, Jesus understand his purpose. He understand why he was there. He was given birth because it was part of his great plan of salvation that the Father has in mind. The God, the Father, sent him. Can we go back to the first slide? Yeah. The first slide. Yeah. So, so Jesus sees it very well. It is God the Father sending him into the world. Right? So when it comes to his prayer before the cross, when he, if you like, refocus his mind and, and uh, wonder, now is this the ultimate? Is this the cup which I am facing? Something that I have to take. And that's why he later on and pray, Father, let this be done, not according to my will, but yours. So the, fa so the son knows the father's heart very well. And in the heart of the father is to bring about the salvation of humanity through the mission which nobody else can achieve except his only son. So if we come to the second slide, so when Jesus was sent into the world, he knows it is for the salvation. And the Apostle John sums it up so well with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his own, his one and only son. He gave, he sent his son, right? That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So Jesus knows he was sent by the Father for this reason, not to condemn the world, but to bring about the lost humanity home to God, to forgive them so that they will not perish, but have eternal life, but to be saved from the penalty of sin, which is death, right? So this is why he, he knew that this cup that he's going to take is for that purpose. Now, so in what manner did he fulfill this mission? Of course, it's the cross. It's his death. Now, in Matthew chapter 20, in the next slide, on any location, George, our Lord spells it out very clearly how he is going to achieve the salvation of the world. He said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. 
not only as a servant, but to give his life as a ransom for many. And that is his mission. He was sent to save the world from the bondage and the consequences of sin through his death. Through his death, he pays for the sin, for the wages of sin, which is death and separation from the eternal God. So to do this, he paid the greatest price that no one can and no one could. That is through his death on the cross. And that's the message of the cross. And that's the message of the gospel. So on this Mission Sunday, I think it is appropriate to go, to go back to the heart of the Christian message. For without Christ, there is no salvation. And Christ alone is the only way to God the Father. And he is our salvation. He is the saviour of the whole world. And so if we move on to the next slide, so Jesus said, as the Father has sent me to fulfill this mission, which I am going to do, and in a few, in, in a few hours later, he was betrayed. And on the cross, he said, it is finished. Now, he's not only referring to his life is finished, but his mission is fully accomplished. He has through death, paid for us as our ransom, so that we may live through him. Now, but before his death, in his prayer to the Father, he said, look, since I'm not going to see them anymore, well, I'm, I, I will be separated from him, from, from my disciples. I will pray for them. But my prayer is not that they will be taken out of the world. They should remain in the world. So therefore in verse 15, which is not on the slide, John 17, uh, verse 15, the Lord said, my prayer is not that you, Father, take the disciples out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. Not only for protection, Jesus said, look, as you are sending me out, I am sending them out into the world. That's why Father protect them so that they can carry on this great mission which the Father has in mind. Now, <coughs> So when the disciples have been given this mandate, they are being sent into the world for the salvation of the world. This is the mission of the disciples. It is clearly spelled out that their purpose on earth is being sent out for the purpose of the salvation of many. Now, of course, we do not die for the others as ransom. We cannot pay for the sin of others. That can be only paid by God the Son, which he could only do it. But God is sending out his disciples as witnesses. And that takes me to the next slide in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said to the disciples after the resurrection, He said, look, now the, the, the redemption part is paid for, and you will remain on earth, but you will be my witnesses on earth in Jerusalem, in Judea, 
and Samaria and to the ends of the world. But you are not alone. God the Son is sending out his Holy Spirit with his disciples. That's why he said, but you will receive power from the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came to God's people in a great way. And uh, from then on, I think the disciples knows very clearly that they were sent. They were anointed with the Holy Spirit. They are going to be co-worker with the Holy Spirit. Reaching out to the whole world, to the ends of the world, to bring salvation, to bring this lost human race back to God. Through God's spoken and written word, that people can come to faith to the living word, the Logos, Christ, for, for salvation. Now that is the purpose of the disciples being in the world. Now you might say, well, that seems to be all right for the apostles, but does it apply to a normal Christian? I'm not an apostle, I'm not the pastor or the evangelist. I'm not even a trained Bible teacher. But Jesus said, look, you, he's referring to believers. If you are a follower of Christ, you are a witness for Christ. That's what it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will, buy, you will be my witnesses. Now, how do they carry out this good news? Now, the early church faced much, much hardship and persecution because of their faith in Jesus. We read in Acts, because of the preaching, the resurrection of Christ, because they boldly witnessed that Jesus is the Son of God, Peter was threatened and imprisoned, James was killed, and many people faced persecution and death. For example, like Stephen, he was stoned to death for his faithful witness for Jesus. Now because of this, fear has driven many believers out of Jerusalem. They were forced to leave Jerusalem, Judea, and went as far as Cyprus. And that brings me to the next slide on Acts 11. Yes, they went far and wide as far as to Antioch, spreading the word. Now that's the wonderful part, isn't it? Wherever they go, they never stop being witnesses for Jesus. They never stop telling people through God's word that Jesus is the living word, spreading the word, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Now, because of their obedience to Jesus, command to go and be his witnesses, and they experience Jesus' promise of the power of the Holy Spirit. It is not through their powerful preaching, it's not through their wonderful evangelistic campaign, it's not through the 
eloquence of Greek preachers is not even through the hands and work of the apostles, but they were just ordinary, fearful, uh, fearful believers running away from Jerusalem for their lives. But as they do so, as they witness for the Lord, as they spread this, this good news of salvation, the Lord was with them by the Holy Spirit. Right? The conviction comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not through human eloquence. It's not through intellectual uh, dialogue. Yes, they have a place. But ultimately, it is the Holy Spirit work bringing the person to their, his or her knees. This conviction work of the Holy Spirit was a work of God. And in Acts 11, we read, the Lord's hand was with these ordinary believers who has not stopped witnessing for Jesus. And as a result, a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now for those who know the uh, Acts story well, and you will know that Antioch is the second church of, the, uh, of Christ in, in that generation. And uh, the size of Antioch church has grown so much that the Jerusalem church spent, sent people to find out what's happening there. And it is at Antioch that Christian followers were first called Christians. Now, we are known by others as Christians. And do you realize we owe our faith, if you like, through the very work of those early Christians who went away from Jerusalem. They were ordinary Christians carrying out the gospel of Christ to Antioch. And so we can, if you like, trace our line through the generations of Christians, through their witness, through their sharing of Jesus, back to Antioch. And of course, back to Christ himself, ultimately. So, what, what, so you might ask, well, that sounds great. We give thanks to God for our salvation, which we should do. But on our Mission Sunday, I want to spare some thought on what are we here for? Now, as the early Christians running away for their lives, but carry the gospel with them. Now, I'm wondering today, are we not being sent by God to carry the good news even in the most dangerous situation? Now, we are facing a pandemic situation. Many people are scared for their health and uh, many people were locked in and uh, some of us are anxious of our food supply, are we going to run out of these or that? Now, surely, naturally, we worried for our own safety, we worried about our family. In the same way as the early Christians running away from Jerusalem, I'm sure they were always looking behind their back. And they were always wonder, 
if the persecution will catch up on them. But none of this stop their witnessing for God. I think in the same way we're encouraged by God that even when we are facing this life-threatening condition, even though we are locked in, even if Australia is going to step up the next phase in the control of the virus situation to have a complete lockdown. Nothing can stop us from telling others of the good news. How are we going to do it? I think there are ways and means. For example, the fact that Today, we can communicate through this wonderful technology gives us, you know, give us encouragement. Nowadays, missionary are not necessarily someone who had to cross countries and cross the language barrier. You and I, sitting in the comfort of our own home, can reach out to someone who is locked in, do you realize I am actually getting access into your living room, wherever you are, through this wonderful technology? So therefore, brothers and sisters, are we not able to take this opportunity to connect with people via your mobile phone, using WhatsApp, WeChat, Skype or any other modern technology reaching people without crossing the street or leaving your front door. You have full access to the world, to your friends, to your relatives, to anyone who needs to hear the word of God for hope. Now, there are many people who are asking, is there a purpose in this virus? Is God exercising judgment on us? Now, there are many people asking questions like this. Do we have an answer? Now, we may not have an answer to fix the cure for this virus. We might not have an answer to the question that many people bring to us, but we can turn them to God's word for comfort. As I shared last, last week, if someone who is asking you, well, how do you manage in this crisis? How do you find hope in the midst of this pandemic situation? perhaps you may be able to share with them and say, look, I am scared as much as you are. However, I find that word of God gives me trust. Can you see, can you see what I mean? We can turn our conversation and show people to God through his word. And perhaps you might like to read the Bible with them. If they don't have the Bible, you can say, hey, not to worry, I have the Bible, I can read with you. For example, you read Psalm 91 and say, look, I'm scared too, but the Bible says, he or she who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And that's why you said, I can say that God is my refuge and my fortress. It is God in whom I trust. See, brothers and sisters, opportunities are here in spite of our present locked in. Mission is not something <coughs> that we, you know, some, something of an option mission it's something that god has sent us out to do 
this mission is not an afterthought, as I have shown to you before. It is in the mind and the heart of God from the creation. And if you look at the Bible from the beginning to the end, that is God's plan to bring the human race, though lost, those captured by sin, to find our way back and to be released from sin to our destiny, which is described in Revelation 21. The destiny is we will be with God in a new heaven and new earth. The Redeemers and the redeemed together forever. That's God's plan. So mission, brothers and sisters, is not an is not an afterthought. It is God's plan right from the beginning. It is in God's mind, in God's heart, to send Jesus to carry out and to pay for our sin as a ransom. And it is it is this risen Lord who sent us out. This mission is not for this specialist or the chosen field. It's for everyone, for every Christian. You and I have a part. You and I can reach out to persons that only you know, that only you can share the gospel with. Now that's, that gives us a wonderful encouragement, isn't it? What are we here for? Why is God keeping us here? So that brings me back to the prayer of Jesus in John 17. Jesus did not pray that we are taken out of this world, but he prayed that we should be protected from the evil one, and he prayed that we will remain here as the one being sent into the world to be his witness. Now when you think of it, life is really worth living, isn't it? Every day is another excitement, another opportunity to be a witness for Christ, reaching out for God to carry out the mission that He has in mind. You and I have this wonderful privilege to do so. Isn't it great? I think the whole world is now watching and wondering how this virus is going to develop or are we going to see the end of it or when? When is the vaccine going to be uh, 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 sort of invented? And uh, how are we going to cope? Now, when the world is looking, I'm sure they are looking at Christians too. The way we react in these circumstances the way we express our trust in God, the way we speak to those who are in need, are ways of uh, means to bring people to Christ. Because when they do not read the Bible, where do they turn to? They can see the lives of Christians showing God's word in a most vivid way. So as someone says, look, Christians are the walking Bibles. Now when you think of it, it is quite a high calling, isn't it? But on the other hand, this is what we are here for. We are here to bear witness to the living word by carrying out our duty, our responsibility. So do you know anyone who is in need? Do you know what anyone who, who, who needs shopping? Do you know anyone who may be facing financial hardship 
because of this pandemic situation? Do you know someone who is elderly or vulnerable who are in need of perhaps cleaning and some cooking? Now, there are numerous opportunities when we can show the world that indeed we care because we believe in a God who cares. To show the world that we love because we believe in a God who loves. I hope that when we see our Lord face to face, we will give thanks to the Lord and say, Lord, thank you for sending me out, sent it to be part of your rescue mission. And we can always, uh, we can also give thanks to God and say, Lord, thank you that you see me worthy to be part of your great mission of salvation for mankind. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that in the midst of this crisis, we see the purpose of our living. Lord, we give you thanks for your protection. And we thank you for your provision that we are not lacking and we are safe. But Lord, our mind goes to people who are scared. We are mindful of people who may not be saved physically and spiritually. Lord, we know it is in your heart that's, that those who are in fear should find hope in you. Those who are lost will be find their way back to you as your children. Lord, help us to be mindful of these people around us. Lord, we give you thanks that you have kept us alive and you have sent us out in times like this so that we can be witnesses for you to bring your blessings of salvation reaching to many. May your will be done in our lives. For we ask this in the name of our Jesus, of our Lord Jesus. Amen.